other. Um, and also you can use the chat box and feel free to um, speak up on the mic. Um, you can unmute yourself and do that if you prefer as well. So we're really excited to talk about this today um, in our session strategies for assessing an OER incentive program. Um, so I also want to um, just as, as a little bit of introduction, I manage the OER program at the University of Houston, which includes our incentive program. And Sherry and I have been working really closely together for several, at least the past several months, specifically on refining and improving our assessment strategies. Um, and uh, again, the idea is that hopefully we can all learn from each other here. Um, but also as I looked into the literature and what resources are out there about OER program assessment, I found that there's not quite as much as there is um, for assessing the effectiveness of OER that are adopted in specific courses. And of course, both of those topics are important. Um, and I think you'll get a little bit of both in this session. So I just wanted to say that even if you're not someone like me who does manage a program or you know, maybe you don't have an incentive program or a grant program or anything like that, I think there will be interesting and relevant takeaways um, for anyone here that's interested in any kind of OER assessment or evaluation. These are our learning outcomes. Um, we hope that the session will help you be able to select appropriate strategies for assessing the impact of OER adoptions and use assessment data to inform and improve upon institutional OER efforts. So we also wanted to start by learning a little bit more about who's here. Um, so feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat. Um, and tell us what brings you here today. And are there certain questions that you hope to have answered in this session? I'll give you all a minute or so to kind of put your thoughts in the chat. We were chatting before the session officially started about how Sherry and I were really interested to see what questions you all have or kind of what direction the conversation takes so that we could probably go in any direction that it goes. Hello to everyone who's introducing yourself. Okay, we, we have people saying um, they're looking for information on how to assess the quality of OER, interested in new ideas about assessing OER. Okay. Needs to, someone needs to create or adopt an assessment model. Is assessment mandatory or voluntary? Oh, okay, that's a good question. Looking forward to seeing how OERs are assessed. Okay, this is great. Okay, this is good. I, I'm loving all of the responses we're seeing. Um, maybe this is a good time to move on to a little bit more background on our program and move into that bit. Um, so again, a little bit of uh, background just to sort of set the stage with where we are. Um, a main piece of the OER efforts um, at the University of Houston is our alternative textbook incentive program, um, which began in 2018. So through this incentive program, the library provides 
modest monetary incentives for faculty to replace required commercial textbooks with the adoption, adaptation, or creation of OER, or a combination of OER, library resources, or other freely available materials. Um, so from that description that you may you might notice a few important characteristics of our program. One that it focuses on removing the cost of textbooks for students, right? Replacing a required textbook with something that's no cost. Also that the scope of this program goes beyond OER. It's not strictly OER specific, um, but includes other resources um, like library materials that are available to students at no additional cost. Um, so essentially our program is very much rooted in textbook affordability and that's how it got started. And that's likely the case for many people here today as well. Um, in a survey that our Student Government Association ran a few years ago, a significant percentage of students reported that they had not purchased a textbook due to its cost, as well as other effects such as earning a poor grade, taking fewer courses, not registering for specific courses, and dropping a course because of the textbook costs. And that grounding in affordability really set the stage for where we initially focused our assessment. I think you'll see that as we move through the session today as well. So currently we are in the third year of offering a tip, which is um, short for the Alternative Textbook Incentive Program. Um, so in this third year, we've now awarded 58 total courses or projects. I may refer to it either way. And here's an overview of our assessment strategies. Um, right now, I'll just kind of give a brief overview, and I'm sure we'll get into more specifics later. Um, so in addition to the number of courses that have gone through ATIP, um, which I mentioned on the previous slide, we also track the enrollment in those courses, as well as the estimated cost savings that students see from open or alternative textbook adoptions. Um, moving beyond um, just looking at the numbers and cost savings, to complete the program and receive the full award amount that's offered, uh, the instructors submit a brief report at the end of the semester or the end of the year, um, and the bulk of that report includes a narrative summary of their students' reception to the alternative text and an evaluation of their teaching experience, plus some other information. And instructors in ATIP are also required to distribute a student survey. Um, and the survey asks about the quality and the ease of access of the alternative text. And just a side note, I'll say alternative text or alternative textbook because that's the name of our program and because it goes beyond OER specifically. Um, but this, the student survey also um, asks students of other information such as when they first accessed the material, whether they purchased a print copy or if they printed it on their own, um, and whether the availability of free resources would impact their enrollment decisions, things like that. Um, at this point, I really want to emphasize how much this has been an ongoing iterative process, right? Like what you're seeing on the slide is where we are now, but we haven't always had um, all of this streamlined from the beginning. We're just constantly learning and making improvements um, to what we're doing. And I want to pause there and see if Sherry had anything to add in while I check and see what's coming in on the chat. Um I think I would just reiterate a lot of what Ariana has said. Um, we have had a program for a few years now, which Ariana has been running for, for most of that time. And we've gotten to a point in the process where we, we have a lot more information. We, we have some flexibility to, um, to change up how we're assessing things. And it's kind of an, an obviously good point to, to reassess our strategies. And so that's part of what the process that led to this workshop began with, with our own sort of exploratory assessment um, to sort of figure out what the direction should be. And, and I don't know that we've come to a conclusion about that yet, but this is hopefully of use to you um, in seeing what that kind of process has looked like for us and where we think we're going with it. Yeah, and I'll, I'll quickly address some of the questions I'm seeing. Um, so one is, where does the money come from to support ATIP? In the very first year, it was funded by the Office of the Provost, who the Provost gave her support, and she really supported this textbook affordability and OER initiative. So it started out with um, Provost funding, but after that first year, um, shifted to being funded out of the library. Um, what instruments do we use in the student surveys? Um, so our survey is adapted from a survey that 
is used at the University of Texas at Arlington. Develop well, I think it's developed by Michelle Reed. Um, so it's very similar to the survey they have available. And well, so our slides are available on the the conference page, but we have some updated slides that we'll make sure we put in the conference proceedings that have all of those references listed. Um, so you'll be able to find exactly what we modeled our survey after. And let's see. When you speak to the student survey, your faculty members give what are the key topics questions. So yeah, some of the, the questions I mentioned were, I don't know all of them off the top of my head, but whether when they first accessed the material, so whether it was before the semester started, on the first day, sometime in the first or maybe second week, um, whether they purchased any material, so maybe if an OER was available for print on demand versus whether they printed on their own or if their instructor provided print material, and another question I have noted down here is um, whether the availability of free resources would impact their future enrollment decisions, as well as what you see on the slide here, such as how they would rate the quality and ease of access of the material used. We're getting a lot of good questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, course catalog markings. Um, so our the way that we do course markings is through our Follett bookstore, the Follett Discover system. We have it set up so that faculty submit their textbook adoptions, but they also have the option to indicate that they use OER in their course. So that's how it gets marked in the course catalog so students can see that information. And questions directed to faculty and was the faculty survey separate? Yeah, the faculty, I refer to it as the faculty report. So this is part of our incentive program and is one of the requirements or expectations for faculty to act to officially complete the program. And it's that when they're finished teaching the course for that year, they submit this report. And the main pieces of it in my mind are that narrative of their students' reception to the material, as well as that narrative evaluating their teaching experience. Um, and there are a few other questions as well, um, just confirming the, the resources they used, um, how much time did this take them, asking about their enrollment um, in the courses, things like that. Did we find many of the students do purchase print on demand version? Um, who do you use for print on demand? So we don't have any um, standard um, service we use for print on demand. That was out of um, curiosity to see if that does come up a lot for students. And I don't, re I don't recall any specifics, but I can tell you that not very many students did purchase print on demand. Um, yeah, more likely we saw students saying they printed material themselves. All right, this is awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on to our next slide. Hopefully I didn't miss any questions that came up just now, but if so, go ahead and put them back in. We'll come back to it. Hopefully we'll have time at the end too to address any stray questions. Um, oh, where can we see OER assessment strategies? Assessment that just came in. Hopefully this helps with that. Um, so our approach is inspired by the COOP framework. I'm actually not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, but if you're not familiar with this, it's a framework for studying the impact of OER, which proposes four areas to look at, being cost, outcomes, usage, and perceptions. So I definitely recommend checking out this resource. It provides a lot of ideas um, for assessment as well as research for evaluating the impact of OER. And yeah, let's put that link in the chat. I typed it in right. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, it's a great resource. Um, and we're certainly not covering all of these areas listed here in what we do. Um, I'd say that we're more focused in, around cost and perceptions currently, um, with maybe a little bit of the others coming in as well. Um, but when we started out a few years ago, this framework definitely did help guide our um, assessment plan, um, especially to make sure that we weren't only looking at cost and had those other ideas of what, um, what to look at and how to do it. Okay, so this is the point where I take over, at least somewhat. Um, so we're going to start with actually having you all um, look at some of our, our real data about what our current assessment plan has been. Um, when we started the program, because of the uh, because of the 
impact of textbook affordability as a driving factor on the program, most of our assessment strategy has focused on cost savings. And so that's, that's what we have the most complete and the most able to be kind of investigated. Um, so in that interest of that, I'm gonna go ahead and paste in a URL um, into the chat. And that did not hyperlink, but hopefully you all can copy and paste from it. Um, and Ariana, if you'll go ahead to the next slide. Um, we have a couple of charts on this website that y'all can go to and just kind of look at what our assessment strategy really does look like in, in real life. Um, in particular, for now, we'd like you to focus on the first two tabs of this particular website. The one that should open up when you go to the site is estimated savings. Um, and this one looks at our overall savings over time from the ATIP program. And we do also have a few courses that we know are using alternative textbooks of some sort that were not a part of the ATIP program. And you'll see those are highlighted in yellow in the chart. Um, at this point, um, feel free to, to snoop around that chart and see what you think. And similarly for the next tab over, which is savings by college, which is a slightly different view. That one we are looking at number of sections and estimated savings um, by the college on our campus that each course is a part of. Um, and for, for both of these charts, what we um, wanted to do was give you guys an opportunity to see what our data looks like, but also um, to kind of think about what these charts actually tell you. Um, what do they say about an OER program? What do you think is missing from them, from our overall strategy, or, or what would you think that you would find valuable that you can't find in this data? Um, we also would like you to think about whether you're using a similar method. Um, are, you, are you doing something related to this? How's it working for you? Are there pros and cons? Um, and then finally, we're trying to think more about the communication of our assessment and how that, how that impacts overall communication about our OER program. So we're also kind of trying to think about who this information is useful for and why they're interested. Um, so take a few minutes to look at these charts. And, and while you do, please go ahead and um, put comments in the chat or um, unmute and, and ask us questions. We're here to kind of have a conversation about our strategy and how that may impact your programs. All right, we have Kathy saying demographics might be useful, but um, if that's possible, not sure how that could be broken down. Are you thinking of any particular kind of demographics? Yeah, I was just thinking if I could see, I mean, I know I could go Google what your, uh, what your breakdown is as far as uh, Pell grant recipients, things like that, those kind of granular social justice things. But if you had a chart, that just showed what that was maybe for your institution each year, it might be interesting. That's a good point. You know, because it could just be right there. I could click over and see, oh, this is what it's like. This is what they look like this year. This is what they look like the next year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so something like that does exist and I'm Googling it really fast because I know where it is. <laughs> Let's see. Um, so a question we have is why are the numbers smaller in 2020 and 21? Thought they would be larger with the move to online instruction. Edmund, um, which particular chart are you looking at when you're asking that? I'm looking at the fall 2020, spring 2021. Um, Under estimated if, if I'm reading it right, remember, I'm, uh, I'm, I don't do math very well. So the uh, light blue numbers are at 3123. Um, but the blue, the dark blue are at 40 and 16. So there's an increase in the spring 2021, but there's a decrease, right? Am I reading this right? There's from 40 to 31 sections. Okay, so this this is a really good question to sort of inter interpret what we actually have here. Um, so the different colors on the charts, you're using the light blue, the dark blue, and the reddish orange, those represent the different rounds of our incentive program. So the this red is the courses from our 2018-19 round of the incentive program, which was our first year. The dark blue are courses from 
last year, 2019-20, and the light blue is showing um, the current round of the incentive program. And then as we're looking across the bottom of this chart, that's showing the semester in which those courses were offered, right? So what you're seeing here isn't necessarily a decrease from one year to the next when you're looking at this chart or this, these columns on the far right. You're seeing in this current academic year, all of the course offerings from the previous and current rounds of ATIP um, and their um, estimated savings. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yes, I, I will say that it tends to be a point of confusion even for us. And Ariana, if you'd like to check um, the box for show only sections offered during the first year with OER, that would give you a look at what um, each, each year has looked like so far in terms of what the savings is, what the enrollment is, what the number of sections offered are in the very first year that um, each course was offered after the ATIP program. Yeah, so the view I have it on right now showing during the first year, you can get a really um, clean, isolated look at each round of the incentive program, right? This is 2018-19 in that year. This is 2019-20 courses in that year. And then same for this current year, whereas when we select all, it's also showing where we have information on when those courses were repeated over time. So it's a little more confusing on this all view than it is on um, this one here. Let me yes. check and see what's coming in through the chat. Yes, and while you do that, just a, a quick comment um, about why we still have the option to look at courses after their first year in ATIP. And I mean, from my perspective as, as the assessment librarian, I think that data, it is more confusing to look at, but it also shows the continuing impact of our program. And that's something that we do wanna get, even if we're not treating it in the same way that we would the data from the first year. Really interesting conversation in the chat around um, STEM areas and how to increase OER, um, development of OER ancillaries for those areas. There was a question or comment I wanted to come back to. Okay, um, Deanne said that they use a Qualtrics survey for both faculty and students, and they have many years of data but need to dig in and take a closer look at what they have. That is exactly <laughs> what happened. Like That's how we got here because I, we were probably in similar situations where we had um, a lot of information, but hadn't really intentionally um, looked at it. And, and so part of my motivation going into this project with Sherry was I have all this great information. I don't have an easy way to analyze it, visualize it, like what do we do here? So that's when we part of why we really started working towards like figuring out how to set this up so that we can actually see um, all this information and what's going on and allow it to inform what we're doing. Ah, Kathy asked, do you use the Spark recommendation to calculate savings? Let me see what the other question is. Did you mention in a previous session you averaged? Oh, that wasn't me that mentioned something in a previous se se session, unless I, I don't recall. Um, that is something we can talk about how to estimate savings. Um, Maybe I'll go to that slide now and then we can come back to whatever other questions are coming up since there are a few questions about how to calculate cost savings. So I'll go back to the slides and kind of skip forward a little bit. Oh, there we go. It's the right slide. <laughs> Only skip forward one slide. Um, okay. So my thoughts on cost savings and how that is actually calculated or estimated. Um, it's not really straightforward. Um, there are a lot of different ways that you could go about this. And I, I don't think there's any like truly accurate way to determine cost savings, right? Because there's no way that you would know how much students would have actually spent on purchasing a textbook for that course, right? They have so many different options of where to purchase, how, whether they um, rent or obviously don't purchase a textbook, right? That's where a lot of this comes from is students can't afford the textbook. So there's no accurate representation of what the cost savings are in my mind. I hope that makes sense. Um, and and um, so a lot of institutions do use an estimate, right? So $100, I think is a really common estimate that is used. Um, Amy Hofer from Open Oregon um, has 
I've written about this. Um, and again, that'll be in our updated slides with the references, which we'll put in the conference proceedings. Um, another estimate could be the one referenced um, in the chat that came out of Spark. I think it was around $117, something like that, that they found to be the average savings between courses that use traditional materials and those that use OER, right? And you might use a different estimate kind of across the board for, for another reason. And I'm sure there's other sources out there that have, um, uh, it, data on estimates that you might use, um, depending on how you want to calculate. <clears throat> um, so compared to using just like a standard estimate, you could also use the actual cost of the textbook. Um, that's also inexact because, again, of so many different purchasing options, right? Are you going to be looking at the cost from your campus bookstore, from the publisher, from Amazon? maybe an average of you know, options that are available. Again, there are a lot of different things you can do, different approaches you could take. Um, again, I think any of those are reasonable, right? And you may use one approach or another just based on um, your context, right? We have different reasons for taking different approaches and I think that's fine, but it's important to um, just know what your method is going to be and kind of set what that is and tr maybe try to make it as consistent as possible, as well as understanding the limitations of whatever method you do choose. Um, so you can see here um, how we do it at UH. So we decided to calculate cost savings using the publisher price for a new print textbook. Um, so we figured this was a way to account for the range and textbook costs, right? We wanted to have the information of whether it's a $50 textbook or a $200 textbook. That was important for us. And um, using the cost from the publisher site seemed like it would be more consistently available as a place to pull from. Of course, a significant limitation is that it doesn't reflect the reality of students' purchasing habits, right? They don't for the most part, purchase a new print textbook from the publisher site, and we know that. Um, so what our numbers represent is kind of theoretically how much students would have saved um, if, they, if they all purchased a new copy of the book. And what that means for me is that when I'm ever, whenever I'm sharing information about cost savings as a result of OER adoptions, it's really important for me to communicate those limitations, right? I always, right, whether I'm sending information to my dean, to the provost, anyone else who's interested in those kinds of numbers, I say this is an estimated maximum cost savings. I don't want there to be any um, misunderstanding about what these numbers represent. Um, and basically, it'll only ever be an estimate. And the method we're using likely falls on the high end of that estimate. I'm gonna pause there again. Okay, great. Looking in the chat, lots of great information being shared. Um, maybe we, so, well, I don't know, we can go back to looking at the, um, the site that we shared before, because there was a lot more there as well that we didn't get to. I wanted to make sure we talk about cost savings for the people that were asking about it. So let me, Oh, here we go. Sherry, do you want to talk about the third tab we have here? Sure. So the third tab on this particular website um, is, is another piece of data that we had pulled together early on. Um, and this piece is a lot more for our own internal purposes as opposed to the cost savings data, which I don't know about Ariana, but I kind of think of that as data that's for our administrators, both at the library level and the university level, because that is such a, a driving force for, for why the program exists in the first place. Um, but this data is a little bit more of interest to, I would assume, Ariana and also our liaisons and possibly people in um, the colleges at, on our campus um, as they are trying to work through this whole process. Um, this particular chart has two different types of views that you can look at. The first one is project type. Um, our three categories for project type are author, um, adopt, or modify. And um, for that, you can kind of look through a bunch of different categories to see what sorts of themes there are among what um, 
what project type is being chosen most of the time. The view that I'm per personally currently looking at is by college. So you can see there's some significant themes about what different colleges choose to do more of the time. Are they, are they authoring their own OER? Are they choosing other alternative textbooks or other materials? Um, are they taking something and modifying it? And I, I think that is just really interesting data to look at. I don't know entirely how it's going to impact our program moving forward, but I think it's interesting. Um, similarly, you can see some themes um, in how that has changed over different years of our ATIP program, um, what it looks like over different course years, and then what the overall mix is. And there's a similar breakdown for different material types. Um, for us, the three material types that we're using are, um, apologies, this chart is loading kind of slowly, um, OER, library resources, and online resources. And so for all of this, um, I guess I have some similar questions to what I had for the other charts. What does this add to um, assessment of an OER program? Does it add something that you don't see in something more numbers-based like cost savings? Um, what, what does this contribute? Does it contribute something useful? What are your thoughts? <laughs> So I do want to add one thing about project type, just that I personally noticed and that I think is interesting. If you take a look at the colleges that are um, tending to author materials, um, as came up in the discussion earlier, a lot of our STEM disciplines have a strong preference for authoring their own materials. And that's interesting to me. Um, so for example, engineering, nursing, and pharmacy, all three have only done author um, relationships and our College of Medicine, which is admittedly quite new and I don't know how this will shake out once they've existed for more than a couple of years, um, but has authored and adopted both. Um, and same for uh, natural sciences and mathematics, but most of our other um, non-STEM disciplines have a broader mix of, of types of projects and that's just interesting. There was a question about if we're tracking student success in the ATIP program. So no, we're not at the point where we're looking at student grades or DFW rates or anything like that. Um, but it kind of comes in a little bit anecdotally through the faculty reports, through what they're seeing from their students and then their classes. But directly, no, we haven't gotten to that point yet. I really, um, I like the comment here. Um, that this kind of information on project type and material type could be helpful for faculty so they can have perspective on what others are doing uh, in their discipline. That's a really good idea that this could be kind of um, included in communication, right? When I'm talking to faculty who may be interested, who wanna know what other people in their college or their discipline are doing and maybe connecting those people too, absolutely. I do want to add a little bit more <clears throat> context to this information too, that it's, again, this isn't a completely exact representation. Um, and maybe Sherry can speak to a little bit of this as well in terms of how we were able to visualize the data, right? <coughs> Excuse me, sorry, something in my throat. Um, so what we see a lot at the University of Houston is instructors um, doing a mix of things, right? Adopting some resources, creating ancillary materials, right? So when you see that, for example, if we're looking at education, that's a good example. You see some with modify, some with author, and some with adopt. That doesn't mean that this many only adopted, this many only authored. This represents um, instructors that did all three of those within one um, ATIP project, right? They were adopting, modifying, and authoring, but there's no way to really um, accurately represent those different combinations of projects, if that makes sense. <laughs> Maybe Sherry can explain that better than I did. 
Um, I, I guess the thing I would add is that the College of Medicine is a really good example of that because that is a, a new program for us in a new college. There is only one ATIP course. Um, and you will see that there is 100% adopt and 100% author. So that that one course did choose to do both. And that, that is a pretty common occurrence, which, I mean, you'll see a good half of these bars extend past 100%. And so that that's a sign that there are a lot of um, a lot of courses that are using multiple different options. All right, we have a question in the chat. Um, did you ascertain whether faculty would transition to affordable textbook solutions without financial incentives, or do we take that for granted due to the time and personal investment required for pedagogical change? That is a really good question that I feel like I could spend a whole nother hour talking about as well. So I'll try to keep it brief. Um, at least it, at our institution, we do have faculty who would certainly move in this direction without the financial incentive. Um, the financial incentive, I think, does help. Oh, actually, let me sidetrack. We do not ask specifically about whether they would do this without the financial incentive. That may have been your question. No, there's. I don't think there's anywhere that we directly ask that, and maybe that's a, a great idea to, to start asking people directly in those faculty reports, for example. Um, but what I have people telling me sometimes is, I mean, yeah, the the monetary award, it's they're they're kind of like that's not why we do it, right? It's not that much. Um, our I don't think I mentioned this. Our incentive program, the awards currently range from five hundred to twenty five hundred dollars, and so that's kind of I see it as like the motivation to get someone intrigued and interested in actually moving down this path within the structure of the program. Um, so in that sense, the incentive does motivate faculty to do this, um, but we also certainly have people who would do it without without that. So I'll kind of stop there before I ramble way off on, on that whole discussion, which would be a really great discussion too. Let me see what else is coming in the chat. Okay, great. Are there any um, before we move on, are there any other questions or comments specifically about anything you're seeing in these charts on the, the Google site that we have? I uh, have a quick question, Ariane and Sherry. If you go to the uh, material type, if you type, if you push the material type, right. So what do you include uh, in, um, uh, how do you define in, <clears throat> excuse me, online resources? Yeah, good question. So I mentioned at the beginning that our incentive program isn't restricted um, only to OER use. So we have here OER, any library resources, and then online resources is anything else that instructors are using to supplement that alternative textbook, right? So it may not be something that's licensed through the library. It may not be something that's openly licensed, but it's something that's available online for their students to access and still use. So we kind of include that as a category here as well. Yeah, and I would add that not all of those are strictly free. They are all reduced from what the original textbook cost would have been, but there are a few at least that are, you know, it might be a subscription to something that's $8 a semester or something like that, but I think the majority are free. Another great question, great question we're seeing is, has the university rewarded this movement by changing promotion and tenure policies? No, we're not. I mean, I would love to hear from anyone who's engaged in that work, because uh, I would love to learn how, how you go about that and how you do it. That's not um, an area of focus for us right now, but it is something um, that we're aware of and maybe on the horizon, hopefully, but it's not something that we've um, seen any movement on at this point. I should probably move on to our next slide and go over the rest of the information we have. So to make sure that we have time to cover it and get to more great questions and discussion that we have going on. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about the faculty reports. And we've talked a little bit about this already. Again, this is part of the ATIP program. Faculty submit this report um, to sort of verify some information and also tell us more about their experience and their students' experience. 
Um, so these are the two um, questions where we ask for a, a narrative, right? Their students' reception and their teaching experience. And, and this, um, this is really important for me because it's a way to learn a lot more about a lot more about their direct experience. And I talk with instructors throughout the year. Um, I work with some more closely than others. So this is a good opportunity to get a lot of really rich and valuable information that isn't captured just in you know, all the numbers and the charts we were looking at. Um, so these are some of the key findings, at least from the first year of um, those reports, of course, that students have improved access to course materials. Students, of course, love that they don't have to pay for anything. Um, also notable was that some faculty saw improvements in student preparation, engagement, and learning outcomes, which they often um, saw directly connected to that increased access to materials, at least based on the information they provided through these reports. Instructors also feel they have greater control over their course content. Right, being um, they felt better able to select appropriate resources and customize those resources. Um, a really interesting um, thread that came up was that several mentioned uh, the benefit of bringing in multiple perspectives and diverse voices um, rather than having a singular text that they may have had previously. And also some challenges and implementation come up throughout um, these reports as well. And again, that's really valuable for me because I always want to know how can I or the library or, you know, how, how can we have better support for them through this process? And it also helps me um, when I'm talking to other faculty who may be interested in OER in the future um, to be more to be completely honest about the process. It's time consuming. It takes time and effort. Everything's not completely easy, right? Because that's what people ask about is, well, how much, how difficult is this? And, you know, I don't really know how to do it, those kinds of things. And just, I like to be, you know, put it out there and let them know, like, it's not always just like swapping in one textbook for an open textbook. It does take time, but we're here to help you. And I can kind of let them know where those, um, where they might have a struggle with like finding materials, things like that. I'm rambling and going off on a tangent about that. <laughs> um, so I also wanted to share a few quotes from these reports. Um, so someone said they struggled for years to find a textbook that covered all of the areas that she wanted to cover. Um, and with this program, she can pick and choose chapters from different books. We saw see a lot of people pulling from multiple sources. Someone else said, I believe I've been able to assess higher level thinking and not as much memorization. And then this last quote is that um, their approach to teaching was more purposeful, more positive, and more self-assured. So these kinds of, um, this can really help tell the story of OER. And I will show a little bit from the student surveys we talked about. Again, these are adapted from the student surveys used at the University of Texas at Arlington. Um, so, just thought it would be nice to share some of the, the kinds of things we're seeing out of this, the kind of information we can get from these student surveys. Um, so we asked, how would you rate the ease of access? Um, you can see here, 63% um, said it's easier to access compared to materials used in other courses. 35% said it's about the same and very, very few said it's more difficult to access. We're seeing similar things when asked about the quality of educational resources. Um, a little more than half said better quality compared to other courses, 45% said about the same, and again, very few saying it's worse. So I'm going to pause there for, mo for a moment and see if there's anything in the chat we can respond to. Okay, great. Um, great conversation about um, course markings going on. So I feel like we're running out of time and I'm glad that we're um, almost to the end of the slides we have prepared. So I think I'll just move forward to um, our last question for you, which was just based on your motivations or reasons for assessing OER, what strategies might you use, right? We'd love to know what you got out of this. Uh, and we talked about a few um, main, uh, main ways that we assess, right, through cost savings, the faculty reports and the student surveys, but that's not all, those aren't the only options. There are a lot of other um, strategies that you could use to assess OER, whether that's from a programmatic perspective or the um, specific resources.
Sherry, Ariana, can I, can I ask a question? I, I hate to keep interrupting, but uh, it, how about if there, do you have any feedback or any data on whether or not the OER um, uh, was, you, a, a student chose the course because of OER or did not register a court for a course because there wasn't OER? I mean, it's an affordability question, right? Right. I'm running through my head to think if we ask about that on the student survey. I know we ask about whether it would impact their future enrollment decisions. And part of why I don't know the answer is because this is, we've kind of recently put together some of this information where we can easily visualize it and haven't necessarily done a deep dive in all of the responses from the student survey yet. But I don't think we ask about that. Mm, maybe we did. No, we do. We do ask about that on the survey. <laughs> I just haven't um, sat down and really looked at that piece of it yet. But that's a great idea, yeah. Yeah, I would just add, I do think that is something that we are likely to, to look at at some point in the future, either as a part of the student survey. And then I, I personally am also interested in sampling our general student population to see if they've encountered courses that use OER or other alternative textbooks and how that influences the, the broader decision making. Because through this, we are we are getting information from students who are in ATIP courses, but we know that not all of our alternative textbook use is coming from only ATIP courses. I feel like this is transitioning a little bit into some of our final thoughts, which include future directions. Um, so some things we wanted to conclude with are that um, cost isn't cost savings is important, right? And it's where a lot of our assessment has been focused from the outset, but we don't think that's the only or the most valuable measure to look at. So we're intentionally trying to make sure we're looking at things beyond just the cost savings that only represents so much. Um, future directions, um, adding depth to the cost related data. Um, so that's, you'll see some of that in the charts we were looking at. Previously, we had a spreadsheet with all the information, just totaled up the cost savings. And now we're looking at how that um, interacts with things like different colleges, um, year to year, um, things like that. So that's a lot of really interesting information that we just recently put together. Um, and also the focus on communicating impact. I mentioned earlier that you know we had all this great information um, but it wasn't set up in a way to really analyze and visualize. And I think the next step is focusing on communicating that, right? So now we have all of this great information and we wanna tell people about it. Um, and also we've kind of asked some of these questions throughout the session. What's meaningful for your audience or audiences um, and what fits your context, right? So thinking about who's interested in this information, why are they interested, and allowing that to um, help guide your direction around these things. Now, Sherry, did you have anything you wanna add? And maybe we have time for like one or two questions if we have an, another minute or so. I think if there are any other questions, that's where I'd rather us spend our time. Hi, this is Lori from UH Victoria. I was just wondering in the current climate with faculty having to make so many changes for other reasons, have you found that they are more likely, less likely or no change to wanna to take on this added thing to their course? You know, I have a hard time answering definitively one way or the other. Um, a big, I, I would say my approach, especially last summer or late spring was completely understanding that people are, are burned out and have so much extra stuff on their plates. So I didn't want to write OVR is a great opportunity, especially in this current climate, but, you know, balancing that with, you know, people have so much already. Um, also part of why I find it difficult to answer this question is it would be easier to, um, respond if we had at this point launched our fourth round of ATIP and could compare, right? Well, how many applications did we get this year compared to last year? Um, but we don't have that because we haven't um, gone into our next round yet. We've kind of taken a pause to reevaluate and reconfigure some things, um, but that'll be coming in the future. And hopefully it'll be really interesting to see like, is there even more of a response to this um, at this point than there has been? Sorry, that's not like a great answer. <laughs> Yes, it is. 
we're, right. we're in the process of launching and I, I really wasn't sure whether, you know, let's go ahead and do it or we should wait and let everything settle down or, thank you. We have time for one more uh, question before we close the session. Okay. Uh, Ariana, may I ask a question? Yes, I know that most of the data had to do with the cost portion of it. Uh, how was the impact on academic success and retention and passing of the students? I mean, that's a, a really good question. And that's something that we don't have information on at this point. Um, I think it's a great idea for future directions and I would love to go in that direction. We just haven't done it yet. Um, so the closest I have is that um, that narrative information from faculty saying my students were so much more prepared for class. There was greater discussion. I feel like they were more prepared because they had access to the materials, things like that. Yes, and I will say from the faculty reports that some of the faculty do put in a little bit of data about how their students are doing in their course and everyone that I've seen that has done that has seen a positive impact. But of course, it's just it's the individual faculty member here and there. It's not programmatic. Great. Thank you so much. This brings us to the end of our session. A terrific one, by the way. Um, I'm, I'm glad that we had such great attendance. Uh, if you have questions for Ariana or Sherry, you can go to the program and there's their contact information. But also note that if you go into the view details button, you can download as a handout their PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so thank you very much, Sherry. Thank you very much, Ariana. Um, and I hope uh, all of you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>